we have heard a lot that Medicare is not sustainable, that the cost of health care is ballooning, that it is pushing other programs out of the way because it's taking up more and more of the pie, that there are better alternatives. Uh, raise your hand if you have heard any of these claims about Medicare. I think every single hand appears to be raised. So you guys have your work cut out for you today because these guys say that Medicare is sustainable and that there are a number of myths that we are hearing perpetuated by politicians, by the media, we know what types those are, and uh, by, by interest groups. And so today we're going to address some of those myths and arm you with information so that when the issue of whether or not healthcare or Medicare is sustainable comes up in your workplace or even outside of your workplace, you'll be armed with the tools and the facts and the figures to have a discussion about that. The campaign against Medicare has gone through a few phases. Really started with the deficit mania, um, you remember under Mulroney and that sort of period, moved into uh, after the, the deep cuts, the $32 billion cut in, mid in the mid-1990s, compounded by the provincial tax cuts, moved into taking over some of the work that we were doing to, um, to show Canadians the horror stories that ensued in their hospitals um, and use those to say that the public health care system wasn't working. Irony of all ironies, the same forces that promulgated the tax cuts and the huge cuts to social services, then uh, blamed the public health care system for those cuts. And of course, what did they recommend? Well, the only thing they ever recommend, privatization in their own interests. Expenditure over GDP, public expenditure, has gone down sharply, and that, in a nutshell, is why you keep hearing these stories about health care spending taking up, public health care spending taking up a larger and larger share of, of, uh, of our fiscal capacity. The reason is because we've been reducing our fiscal capacity a lot. That's what happens when you hold health care spending relatively constant, pink line, and you dramatically slash all other forms of spending. A little bit of, little bit of grade five arithmetic will tell you that the ratio climbs. But it doesn't mean that the healthcare system is running away with the farm. It means that you're slashing everything else, that's all. But that's when you're cutting your taxes, you are in fact reducing the amount of public money available. And if healthcare spending is staying you know, reasonably controlled, it's going to go up as a share of the total. This is what happens, however, when you take that last slide, expenditure per, cap, per person, inflation adjusted, and you deflated by the GDP. And you can see that, yes, it's climbing, and it's climbing again in the recession, but it's gone way down in the past. There are ways of containing expenditures, and it's not that different from where it was at the beginning of the period. So that's, that's for hospitals. It is up for drugs, way up. It's up for doctors, somewhat. But for hospitals, it's back where it was at the beginning. Is it true that we are collectively spending more and more on Medicare? Well, unfortunately, it is true. It's not a big deal, but we are collectively spending a little bit more each year on Medicare as a proportion of our collective wealth. This probably is the bad news. There are two good news that should be kept in mind. The first one is that this growth is actually very slow. The second one, and it is more important, is that we're not alone on that path. For what I know about the statistics, no rich country anywhere in the world is spending less and less each year. Every single rich country is having to deal with increasing spending in healthcare. It's not healthcare that's eating provincial budgets. In fact, it's tax cuts that are eating provincial budgets. And as uh, Robert Evans showed you in the early set of slides, it's easy to look like a bigger fish if the pond around you keeps getting smaller. And so that line that shows um, healthcare expenditure, uh, of course, becomes a greater proportion of provincial budgets if you keep reducing your fiscal capacity.
the right hand side, that's the stuff going up too fast. That's, again, the same thing I was showing you. You sort of look at costs per capita deflated by inflation. But notice that the rapidly increasing lines, hospitals is moving up too, are drugs, green line, and doctors, red line. Those are the ones that are going up recently. And most of that is increase in prices. It's not increase in services. It's not increase in you know, health for people. I want to draw your particular attention to drugs in the 1975, which consumed 8.8%. Uh, I want to be open and say you know, uh, physicians uh, were 15.1%. Were this is of the total pie that existed at that time. That pie is larger now, but it's been rejigged. The proportion of drugs has now gone up to 16.4%. The proportion of drugs has actually exceeded uh, the proportion that goes to physicians. Um, you know, and, and that represents a huge explosion of growth. On the other hand, the hospital sector, your brothers and sisters, has, has shrunk as a proportion. And that's important to keep in mind. Spending are not God creation. We are collectively making decisions. And some of those decisions do have sense, in my own opinion, about the fact that when you have new technology that are proved to help uh, people's life to diminish suffering or to uh, cure things that we are not able to cure, well, maybe collectively it does make sense to spend a little bit more to have access to those technology. But those technology are very uh, few. Lots of what we're spending is on well, maybe not useless, but disputable technology. We have the tendency to fund high-tech, third-line hospital with very expensive technology that don't seem to save that much lives. We even have the tendency to not study this at all. We are very poor throughout Canada in having statistics about the efficacy of different treatment, and we spend collectively a huge amount of resources in unproven technology. But within healthcare, and I think a bunch of the speakers alluded to this, there are also, I think, legitimate fights about where the money is going. And drugs, I mean, within hospitals, for example, and hospitals are always on the front line of cuts, but within hospitals, the growing costs are medical equipment and supplies, drugs and medical gases. Those, all of those things are dominated by the private sector. The employees, the nurses, the support staff, et cetera, have been shrinking as a proportion of hospital budgets, and that's been the case for years. So within the healthcare budget itself, there are areas where we are seeing costs that are, are growing vastly, that don't necessarily, that are not necessarily connected to improving people's health. I wanted to show you this slide because at a time when the Canadian Medical Association was being beset with all kinds of internal and external pressures to say private health insurance is a good thing, it's the way to go, this was their actual conclusion, is that it can provide greater choice and access to services for those who can afford it, but it's not been found to improve access to publicly insured services, lower costs or improve quality, all of which are claimed for a parallel private system. And the evidence from around the world is that that, in fact, is a false assumption. There, there, are, there are tons of them from, from, from various places around the world um, where they experimented with the idea of choice and um, competition between hospitals, which led reasonably predictably to anyone, the sentient human being, that, in fact, what you would end up doing is concentrating wealth in the hospitals so that you would have specialized hospitals and rural areas would suffer and distribution would suffer and so on. And the British Medical Association, you know, that well-known Trotskyite organization, um, has unambiguously come out and said that it's a failure, that the introduction of that kind of market mechanisms in the health system was a failure and should be reversed because they see it from the front line, and, and that's what I've been asked to, to give a, a perspective on. So one of the major things Medicare did was it limited the acceleration of funds going into the healthcare system. It also transferred the burden from, in shorthand, the, the, uh, the uh, 
unhealthy and unwealthy to the healthy and wealthy, because when it's tax financed, then it's going to take a larger proportion of the income of people at higher incomes. I think we can say with reasonable certainty, and we can expand upon this, that privatization introduced into the Canadian healthcare system, and we have to be careful that we don't get too tied up in international uh, comparisons because our system is our system and, and that's what we need to be working with. Privatization will, un will pr almost certainly increase the costs uh, and, and disproportionately load them onto the, the, the lower end and the sick. It will lower the quality, and even the private parallel system in Britain uh, consistently delivers lower quality, which is kind of ironic when you think of people buying their way into supposedly better care, actually getting less good care uh, in that situation. It will lower access, and uh, as has been demonstrated in Australia in a similar system, and it will be unquestionably less equitable. And I want to keep coming back to that issue of, of uh, equitability. So our job, I think, collectively, is to, to calm the panic and, and make wise choices. The problem is not a problem of insurance. Well, collectively, we can decide to spend more or less on different uh, sectors. And we seem to agree with everybody else in the world that it makes sense to invest in health. This is fine. If we want to invest in health, there is one way to fund it, which has been proven to be better, more equitable, more stable, more sustainable than any other single way to fund healthcare. It is a universal, publicly administered insurance system. This is what we have. This is among the best. This is not among. This is the best way you can fund healthcare from. In terms of administrative costs, you know, you raise a good point, and I think we'll probably talk about it more tomorrow. But what, as they bring in all of these market mechanisms, as they bring in all of this hyper, you know, um, administration and measurements for everything in hospitals, we are seeing vast increases in administrative. You know, one nurse was telling me the other day she. She worked in the London hospital, and there used to be offices in the hospital for, um, for administration. And, um, and now they have their own building, multi-floor building, um, to house the administration. And because hospitals are competing on how fast they get patients out, how few staff they have, they have to measure all of that stuff. And then if you add in the pricing and bidding systems and all of the rest of that that they want to bring in in BC and Alberta and Ontario, um, of course, that siphons all that money away from care. Uh, another myth that we hear some, is that um, choice is good, and one way to preserve the public health care system is to allow people who can afford to go into the private system to pay for their own surgeries and get them out of, out of the long waiting line that, that might exist. Um, Bob Evans, could you address why you'd say that that is a myth, that actually allowing people to buy privately is not going to help? the public system? Well, look at it from the physician's point of view or who the, uh, whichever clinic you're talking about. You have here people who are paying privately and pay more than these people over here who are paying publicly or are being paid for publicly. The public prices are lower than the private prices. Which one do I look after? I mean, it's, it's economic nonsense to suggest that income-motivated providers are going to be just as enthusiastic about looking after the people for whom they earn less money than for the people for whom they earn more money. But, so, but what we hear is if there are 100 people on a wait list and 10 of them can go to the private surgery clinic, now there are only 90 people waiting for public health care. And so the what's the problem? And, and at the private surgery clinic, they will get care from the same doctors. It would be different if doctors were not working on both sides of the street, but they are. That's the point. When you have a two-tier system, you steer patients who can afford to pay to the private side, and then you charge them more. I mean, the, the, United, the United Kingdom has demonstrated this ever since the introduction of the National Health Service in 1948, and it's normal economic behavior. You'd do the same thing unless you were sort of a, more of a char charitably inclined. You say, well, I've got a group of people on this waiting list who have money, and they're willing to pay me, and I'm going to see them now. Okay? And I'm not going to create new hours in the day from which I can now see these people privately and see 
patients as expeditiously on the public sector. There's a kind of a notion here that somehow if you privatize the, the part of the delivery system, doctors will appear from Mars. Just to, uh, to expand a, a little bit on that from a, from a physician point of view, uh, and certainly I have had the experience of, of referring a, a patient to an orthopedic surgeon who then tells them, you know, you can wait for two years in the public system or I can do it next week for for 15 grand, you know, that you get those kind of choices, which in Bob's world, I think, is, you know, sort of an idiot's choice, which would you do if you had the 15 grand? But uh, in fact, it's a much more complicated um, situation that we're confronted with both as physicians and as patients when you talk about taking 10 people out of one line and therefore shortening the other line and things can go ahead. In Canada, we do have a genuine shortage of uh, healthcare workers, uh, including nurses, doctors, etc. So when you do start to move uh, significant numbers into a private system and, and, and incent them to do so, you actually take some of what's away from the public system. But it's actually even more complicated than that. In fact, it's, it's very difficult to tease out all of the various factors that go into why this doesn't work. But it doesn't work because in Australia, where we have the wonderful natural experiment, where they've gone this route ahead of us, um, it's very obvious that across the, the Australia, the more private care is given, the more privatization occurs, the longer the public wait becomes. And there are many reasons for that that have to do with the quality of care, they have to do with cream skimming, where you take all the least problematic ones out of the top, where you do a little work with uh, a golfer's knee, uh, but uh, you know, my grandfather, grandmother falls down, breaks her hip, has diabetes and hypertension to complicate matters, they go into the public system. So there's a whole host of adaptations that occur within it. To, to show that it doesn't work. In Quebec, we tend to lead the way in terms of uh, bad practices and uh, funding, which I'm not very proud of, but uh, there was that hospital, a big hospital in Montreal, where they had problem retaining nurses. The working conditions were so dreadful that nurses tend to work anywhere but in that hospital. So they had the doctor, they had the operating rooms, they had the patients, but they didn't have any nurses left. So they were not able to operate the patient, and there are a, a private clinic went to see the hospital and say, hey, we have nurses, just send your doctor and your patient and we'll do the, we'll do the operation in the clinic. And the uh, hospital signed the deal. So now what we're de doing is we're paying more so we can build new operating rooms. We have brand new ones at the hospital that we're not using, but we're paying through our taxes new operating room plus profits for the private clinics. The doctors are operating there, they could be operating elsewhere. And the worst part is, where do you think the nurses come from? <laughs> they have published ads in the newspaper looking for highly experienced nurses in the operating rooms. They are all coming from public hospitals. So now in other hospital, you have nurse shortage shortage even worse than what we had before. And I guess my point from this is, is that there shouldn't be a social dilemma for us because that might be a dilemma if we had to decide, well, maybe if people are making more money, they should be, etc. The point is, it doesn't work. Not only is it wrong, but it doesn't work. So I fail to see the dilemma in this. Why would you introduce a private care system which, as Britain has proved, leads to lower, lower quality of care um, that, as Australia has shown, leads to longer, not shorter, waiting lists. The idea is that there then, as here now, uh, the, the effort to create a sense of crisis uh, is arising out of genuine tensions within the healthcare system. 
the tensions are there. They're always there for reasons that are pretty straightforward in the way that healthcare is provided and funded. And what we're listening to now is a, is a classic Naomi Klein exercise of let's create a crisis so that we can try to stampede people into making political changes that will change the balance of power within the system and give advantage to the people who are beating the crisis drum. Now they've ramped up the criticism because they're trying to get more money into the system, that's what privatization is about, but not at the cost of people at the higher income groups because you want to move it off taxation, move it back onto the patients. So you move the burden down the income distribution, you move access up the income distribution, and you increase the overall flow of funds. Well, that makes perfectly good sense if you're either a provider of health care who's not too concerned about social issues, or if you are a high income person, or if you are a drug company, or you, if you are setting up a private clinic, you want more money to flow in. There is a campaign to dismantle Medicare in Canada. It's organized, it's incredibly well moneyed, it's uh, supremely connected, um, and it's very aggressive at this point. Um, and it's made up almost entirely of, um, of vested interests, people who have direct um, uh, monetary interests in private healthcare companies and insurance companies and other co companies that benefit from uh, privatization. We have, as Bob indicated, um, forces that want to convince us that we need to panic, uh, want to convince us that, that we can't afford the future and we can't afford healthcare as it is, and you certainly can't afford baby boomers like me in a few years, so we better pony up and get a bunch of private money into the system. The system of health, because it is public, is also an object politique, and that the way in which we arrive to make sure that the politique arrive à tenir compte de la rationalité de où on s'en va, de quels sont les objectifs, est très, très difficile, particulièrement dans un système parlementaire comme celui qu'on a, où les groupes d'intérêt sont très habiles pour s'assurer qu'on ne touche pas à leurs intérêts. Si il y a une pression, et il devrait y avoir pression, pour faire un système de santé meilleur, pour que vous puissiez plus rapidement et de façon plus rapide et de façon plus rapide obtenir la soin que vous avez besoin, ça ne va pas se passer sans qu'il y ait une engagement de full engagement of the front line workers in, in rejigging the system, in looking for savings, in addressing quality. Is this idea that healthcare is really only a cost, and we never talk about it really as a benefit. Um, but for those of us who believe in access to healthcare, in access to life-giving, life-enhancing, life-saving care as a basic human right, we need to understand Medicare in Canada really is a huge benefit. It's a huge social wage. In fact, it transfers about $130 billion each year from uh, the wealthy and the healthy to everybody in free services as we need them. That is the economic mechanism of Medicare in Canada. And without that, we would have a society that would be fundamentally different than the one that we live in. It would be much more inequitable. We would face much graver suffering. We already do face suffering when we're sick. It's hard enough to be sick. It's much harder to be sick in a society that doesn't provide a single-payer public uh, health care system. And we would be facing fights for equality on all kinds of levels that we couldn't even really imagine um, having grown up under a public health care system in Canada. I think one of the things, and, and, and I appreciated Natalie's uh, statement, was whoever controls the language will control the debate. And so I think part of it is, uh, it seems paradoxical, is turning the language around to say, this is really about the quality of care. Because we really care about the quality of care, and we can deliver on the quality of care. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've gone over time, so I'd like to thank Bob Evans, Damien Contrantiopoulos, Natalie Mara, and Bob Willard. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to you too for your questions.